place um, today. Uh, you know, happy to be talking to you guys and sharing. Uh, it, it actually, in, in preparing this talk, it, it was kind of uh, kind of uh, cool for me that because it, it, you know I think it, the sort the idea of connecting um, trade and invasions, even though we tend to think that it's really important, I think there's very little sort of synthesis of that. Um, so um, let's see. I tried to advance to the next slide. Let me try this again. Um, okay, yeah. So uh, biological invasions. I'm not going to say much about biological invasions, other than you know, they're obviously a pretty um, important thing in in the world these days, and and a big driver of of uh, global change. And um, you know, there are a lot of things that affect biological invasions, but I think um, the there's a general consensus that the main driver of, of biological invasions is globalization. And that, and, and basically what it comes down to is that, you know, the world's biota is, has through all of evolution been compartmentalized and with these barriers that allow these uh, assemblages to evolve and radiate in isolation. And so these uh, globalization basically breaks down these, these barriers and, and causes this exchange of species ar around the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, in the invasion biology literature, we talk about invasion pathways. Um, and um, the, um, for, and of course, as Lucy mentioned, I, I'm, uh, I like insects. <laughs> and so I study mostly insects. And so for insects, we, the, the kind of main uh, invasion pathways that, um, that that are uh, common are one is the the movement uh, accidental movement of insects um, in in bag air baggage especially for international air passengers and this is something a lot of people many probably many of us in this room we may accidentally move plants or other objects that have insects on them um, um, but also the actual trade and and um, you know people trade internationally in a lot of things and for insects historically the biggest um, probably a pathway for the historical movement of of insects has been um, the global trade in in plants and uh, plant parts too um, and so we know that it, it's because so many insects feed on plants and so if you if you act, if you move an insect from one part of the world to another very often they're insects on them and we don't even know it. Um, um, and then this is, you know, the movement of plants is something that's been going on for a long time. Um, and um, more recently, you know, there have been some major developments in, in sort of the tr technology of trade. And one of those has been the, in the last several decades, the, the development of containerized cargo, which has really uh, facilitated global um, uh, trade. And one of the things associated with, with um, containerized cargo is the use of wood packaging material. And this is something that hasn't been limited just to containerized cargo, but, uh, you know, crates have been used for a long time. But certainly with containerized cargo, one of the key parts of, of, of that type of trade is the use of pallets. And one of the things that um, is an unfortunate thing about the use of this wood packaging is that uh, they actually provide a great pathway for uh, the movement of pa of insects around the world. So those are those aren't the only um, pathways for movement of insects, but they're certainly some of the major ones. Um, and so, the, you know, kind of backing up and say, asking a question: Well, why do we care about modeling the relationship between trade and um, and insect invasions? And I think that the key answer to that really goes back to uh, how can we do a better job of of mitigating this problem? And so. The term biosecurity is the term that's basically used uh, to refer to the programs that uh, countries implement to uh, prevent or minimize the probability of organisms being accidentally moved around the world. And by if we had a better and more quantitative understanding of, of how trade drives uh, uh, movement uh, accidental biological invasions, then we could probably do a better job of of um, of designing um, biosecurity programs. And you know, it's it's a complicated program because you know, international trade has a tremendous number of benefits. That it it basically international trade drives global prosperity. Um, and uh, so there are basically there are costs of of 
trade, their benefits of trade, but the invas invasions are basically a cost of trade. And, and if we had a better understanding of how trade facilitates invasions, then I think that would allow us to do a better job of finding, you know, what's sort of the optimal management of, uh, of trade to, to minimize the problem. So that's kind of the motivation for what I'm going to be talking about. And so it really comes down to the question of, you know, can we model in a quantitative way how imports uh, affect invasions? And again, this is something I think, you know, for as long as people have been paying attention to the problem of biological invasions, we've recognized that there's a connection between imports and invasions, but very often it's just sort of a fuzzy kind of thing that we don't really know, uh, well, how, you know, what are the numbers, how do they play out? How much, how much trade causes how many invasions um, and what kind of species and that sort of thing. So that's, that's kind of what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, so the problem of, of modeling the connection between imports and invasions, it's a challenging thing um, because you know, e even though there, there are many, yeah, there are many reasons why this is a difficult problem. Um, one of the main problems is that it's not just uh, trade that, that, um, that affects the probability of invasions, that there are a lot of uh, time varying things like weather um, that maybe affect, weather disturbance that, that affect the, 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 the extent to which uh, in, you know, receiving regions might be susceptible to the establishment of new species. Um, but then there are also time varying biosecurity. This is one of the things I'm not gonna say much about, but over the last 150 years, there's been this uh, steady, you know, 150 years ago, nobody realized that there was a problem of biological invasions. And so over the last 100, 150 years, there's been sort of this awakening to the problem of biological invasions and, and changes in national policies that, that affect imports and, and, uh, and affect essentially the, the probability of invasions uh, you know, affect this, this relationship between imports and invasions. Um, but then there are also static um, factors that these are factors that, that don't change through time so much, but they probably vary quite a bit um, through space. Um, and these are things like climate um, that, that, for example, that we know they're probably in, in very Northern areas, there are probably fewer invasions. Um, um, uh, but also things just spatial distance that there's a much higher probability of, of an organism with a range. Uh, if, if you're close to the range of species, the native range of species, you may be more likely for that species to invade. And then there are things like the evolutionary similarity between um, the receiving region that, um, especially like I was mentioning for insects, so many insects are plant feeding. And if, um, if an insect encounters a, a, a plant community that's very similar to its native range, it might have a higher chance of establishment than it, if it arrives in a more dissimilar area. So all these things kind of conspire to make this a really difficult problem. We're really interested, in, if we're really just interested in the connection between imports and invasions, sometimes all these other things mask this relationship. Um, so I'm gonna talk about data a little bit because of course, anytime you talk about modeling, the question of data is sort of relevant, right? And um, um, and, uh, you know, th there are a lot of different types of imports that people trade in a lot of stuff, you know, and that can vary from food to, to wood to, you know, ceramic tile and all this thing. And each of these goods have, uh, they vary in the risk that they present for um, the accidental movement of, of insects and other organisms. And so ideally, if we have, if we want to connect, make the connection between this data on, on, tr on imports or trade and invasions, ideally it would be great if we had very detailed data on historical movement of, um, of uh, different commodities. Um, and the reality is that that data, the data that exists historically is quite poor. The, the kind of data broken down in these kind of detailed um, uh, uh, commodity categories, so you know, this sort of standardized uh, coding system, it's very difficult to find these kind of data going back more than say 30 or 40 years. Um, and 
and oops, and but in contrast, uh, you know, the problem of invasions, certainly of insects and probably most other organisms, it's something that's been going on for for like more like 150 or you know almost 200 years. That you know when you look at these kind of time series of numbers of established, the one on the left is is estimates of total numbers of insect species establishing outside of their native range around the world. And the graphs on the right are for um, non-native forest insects. And you can see it was really around 1850 that, that, um, that species started to establish um, outside of their native range. And so if we only have data that goes back 30 or 40 years, it's not very useful, um, at least in terms of historically making that connection between uh, trade and, um, and, and establishments. Um, and in fact, by the way, while I have these graphs up, I want to show you one other thing that you notice, uh, you know, the, the very, you see how in the, the very end of these time series, very often, this is one of the things we look at these cumulative numbers of, of establishments, usually like the last 10 or 20 years, they always kind of poop out. And that's because there's sort of a reporting lag, um, that there's a lag, a time lag between when people discover species and when they actually kind of get into the literature and get into databases. And it, again, it's one of the reasons why when we do analyses relating uh, you know, trade to historical establishments, very often we sort of throw away the last 10 or 20 years because we know the data tend to be very incomplete. And of course, this just makes the problem I was just talking about of the lack of detailed historical trade data on commodities even more problematic because if you're throwing away the last 10 or, 10 or 20 years, then it means you have even less data for these time series that don't go back very far. Um, so, well, so the question is, well, what kind of data is, uh, are there? Um, and, you know, there are actually a lot of different data sets and I would draw your attention to one kind of amazing data set, which is what's, it's called the Trade His database. And basically these guys, uh, these economists, they assembled uh, from a variety of different sources, this massive data set that spans the time period of 1827 to 2014. I think it's been updated since then. Um, and basically it records the um, annual bilateral imports and exports between every country in the world. Um, and it actually ends up being a huge amount of data because <laughs> it's about 1.9 million observations. Um, and this is what the graph here shows that the, the <clears throat> over time, the total value of all imports and exports and it's kind of cool, this is on a log scale, but you see on log scale it kind of increased linearly sometime until um, you know, around the period of the Great Depression, World War II. And basically after World War II, there was this big uh, you know, movement of free trade. I mean, this actually is an interesting topic which I'm not gonna talk about, but after World War II, all the world's leading economists got together and said, you know, there is this connection between economics and war and that we can prevent world wars by promoting free trade and that um, that the activities that they took to reduce tariffs and to make open trade barriers is essentially opened this era of open trade and you can see it just sort of kicked the world into this gear of high volume increases in in world trade um, so another kind of geeky thing about when you use these long time series on trade um, is that, you know, ideally we actually would have the volumes of stuff that's imported, you know, so if we, we are importing um, potatoes from some part of the world, we would actually have, you know, the weight or the number of potatoes imported. But very frequently that's almost, in mo again, if you go back in time, if you want to get data that go back in time very far, you're not going to find it because no one's been keeping track of that. And so what we, what we find actually that does go back farther is value, the, you know, the, 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 the value of the imports. And so, so um, very often we use uh, the value of imports as a proxy for, for the volume of imports. And one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that when you do use historical values of anything, you need to adjust for inflation. And you do this using uh, these consumer price indices, which are very easy um, to find. And you basically have to adjust that because the value, you know, the value of the 
dollar or the pound has changed so much over these long time periods. Um, and then finally, very often we can't even find historical trade and we rely on other proxies for, for trade value, things just like changes in the gross domestic product, the GDP of countries over, over time. And um, so it's, you know, this is one of the things that like a lot of sort of modeling exercises is, you know, you look for whatever data you can find and sometimes it's not as good as you were hoping, but it might work. Um, so before I kind of jump into some examples, um, you know, the stuff I'm going to be talking about, the people, like a lot of the ecological analyses, people have looked at spatial variation in invasions and also uh, temporal uh, variation in invasions. Um, and they're very different problems, but, but with both of those, you can relate the, both of those to, to um, imports or other measures of economic um, activity. Um, this is just one example um, of uh, a relatively straightforward analysis. This is actually not insects. This is numbers of plant invasions looking at spatial variation or geographical variation in numbers of um, geographical variation in numbers of, of, um, of uh, non-native plant invasions in different countries in the world. And they found um, a pretty significant relationship here with GDP. Um, you know, essentially the higher GDP countries, which reflects probably more imports and other economic activity than more invasions. Um, so, uh, and one of the things, again, I wanted in that, this paper that I was just showing, they, the, the variable that they were modeling was uh, total numbers of non-native plants. And so you'll find some studies where, you know, this, the models are, are they're attempting to measure total numbers of invading um, species. But there are other um, studies where people uh, focus more on individual species. That is, they may focus on, you know, you may find a study where someone's interested in a single species and what's, what affects the probability of invading different parts of the world. Or they may look at a large number of species and in, in a sort of uh, composite model um, quantify the probability, what the factors that affect the, the probabilities of invasion. And I can just uh, mention one project that I've been involved with where we've looked at, um, we have amassed a data set on historical invasion of fruit flies to fritidae around the world. We have like some 27 species that have invaded um, non-native uh, areas outside of their range. And these fruit flies, are, they're actually a species, these that receive a lot of attention from these biosecurity programs because they can have big economic impacts. Um, and so we assembled this massive data set essentially on the presence or absence of these 27 species out in both their native range and their non-native range. Um, and then uh, we basically used, a, so basically it was sort of zero one data um, in for each species uh, in each country. And then we fit a, a generalized linear uh, mixed effects model uh, to test for the effect of a bunch of uh, both time varying and static variables. Um, and, um, and, and in this, I don't show it, but we were, one, of the, one of the variables that we considered were, uh, because there's no time in this model, it's saying over, over um, you know, 150 years, did the species invade or did it not invade? Um, and one of the variables we used was cumulative imports using the trade has database. And in the case of these fruit flies, we didn't find a significant effect. And, that, and I think the reason for that is because um, fruit flies, you know, they're not in this trade test or total imports, that's total imports. And, and fruit flies actually, they're probably the main way either they've gotten in historically with specific fruit have been in, imported, but more often they invade with fruit that's carried by people, by like passengers in either ships or in airplanes. And so that's probably the reason why imports uh, didn't have an impact on, on the invasions of the species, but things like total economic activity like GDP did. Um, and then the other thing, using this uh, type of statistical modeling approach, we could actually look at species specific risks associated with each species um, and, and then identify which species have the highest probability of overall invasion after adjusting for all these other things like GDP and climatic similarity, et cetera. Um, 
So it's a way of sort of saying, what are the most dangerous invaders, which is probably sort of a useful th thing for biosecurity programs. Um, another um, study I'm gonna mention is that I've been involved with was where we, we were looking at total numbers of non-native insects. Um, we assembled a database on total numbers of non-native insects in 45 different regions. And they've varied all the way from, you know, big areas like all of Europe to little tiny islands in the Southern uh, Pacific. Um, and, um, and basically, the, yeah, so we basically, this is just showing the data, the total numbers of non-native insects in North America, I can say very proudly is number one, <laughs> the dubious record of having the most insect invasions. Um, and so there's quite a bit of variation, obviously, um, in, in numbers of invasions. And obviously land area, since I was mentioning this, the, these regions that we analyzed included, had quite a bit of variation in land area. And the whole, in, in biogeography, you know, there's this whole species area relationship that even for native uh, uh, plant and animal species richness that we know is a very strong relationship that basically larger land areas tend to have more species than small land areas. Um, and this is something that when you look in these data, you see there's this very strong relationship both with, we have both had total numbers of non-native, of native insect species and non-native insect species. They both show this very um, strong species area relationship. Although I may note, this is one thing that people have found in, in different Tax or not just insects, that typically the species area relationships for non native species tend to be less strong than for native species, which is an interesting thing. Um, but we had a whole bunch of, of other things um, that we were interested in, in trying to make sense of what are the factors that really drive the total numbers of invasions um, in, in these different, rural, the geographical variation. And these included things that affect propagule pressure, the rate at which species are presumably arriving, um, but also the invasibility, the extent to which different regions are more susceptible to invasions. And um, this included GDP, but also things like just the distance to the mainland, number of people, which is occupants, and then land area. And, and we also had data on number of plant species. And we were interested in predicting numbers of native insect species, as well as the number of non-native insect species. Um, and so to make in these kinds of situations where you have a lot of these variables, which are quite all kind of related to each other and sort of a causal network, and in some cases collinear with each other, we adopted uh, structural equation modeling, which is, a, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but it's a really powerful method for these kind of complicated interactions with covariant variables. And this is the kind of results that you get from structural equation modeling, where you basically can quantify the strength of these interactions. Um, and it turned out that GDP was actually not very important in predicting um, non-native insect species richness, which was what we were interested in. And in fact, actually land area itself didn't have a significant direct impact on numbers of, of uh, either native or non-native insect species richness. Um, but instead, the kind of driver for insect, both native and non-native insect richness was plant richness, that native plant ri richness, um, as well as non-native plant richness, had this strong impact on numbers of, of um, insect species. So the kind of interesting relationship that basically non-native plant, you know, essentially plant invasions are driven both by just land area, but also number of people. Um, and that that in turn drives insect invasions. And so it's kind of an interesting result. And I think and it probably kind of reflects the fact that we know, again, there's so many plant um, insect species are plant feeding. And then those that don't aren't plant feeding, they, you know, they're insect, a lot of insects are at higher trophic levels and they feed on insects that feed on plants. And so when you have, this is the idea that when you have more plants, this creates more ecological niches for for insects and for herbivorous insects and the feed, things that feed on herbivorous insects. And as a consequence, you have more plants, you get more invasions, um, which is an interesting thing. Um, so I'm gonna finally switch gears and talk a little bit about from spatial temp variation, modeling spatial variation and invasions to temporal invasion um, variation in invasions. Um, and one of the things, um, and this may seem like a really simple thing, but it, it's, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, when we have data, we, you know, we've got, I've been involved in a lot of efforts where we've gone to great lengths to assemble records of when species were discovered 
um, as I'll mention in a bit, we, we essentially never can actually uh, observe when species establish, but we essentially observe when non-native species are discovered. And very often you'll see well, people plot cumulative numbers of, of new establishments over time. Um, but I think the point I wanna make is in drawing the connection between imports or economic activity and invasions, it very often is more useful to look at numbers of new invasions over time through time rather than this cumulative number because the cumulative number it's going to go up right <laughs> and if you have a number like uh imports you look at the relationship between imports and um, invasions of course you're going to get a relationship and so i think very often you can actually learn more about the relationship between imports and invasions by looking at at numbers of new in invasions um, through distinct through time rather than just cumulative numbers um so in general um you know, the, the, what we would expect to see is that because we know that that um, imports have this strong, should have this strong effect on establishments that if you look at the two time series that they should sort of track each other. Well, would that be the case? Um, and, the, and this is where I wanna raise the question of, of species, source species pool. That is that uh, when species invade from one region to another, Theoretically, there's this pool of species sitting out in their native ranges that are waiting to be introduced to new regions. And if those source species pools are infinite um, or very big, then over time, um, you essentially don't deplete them. And that if you have, say, a constant, if you import or sample from those communities over a constant rate, then you should get this continued linear increase in cumulative numbers of of um, establishments. But if there's a finite number of species, then you should begin to deplete the species pool and you get the sort of um, attenuation of establishments. Um, and so this is something that um, there's a really, you know, one of the key papers in, in you know, the relationship between trade and, and establishments was this paper by uh, Levine and D'Antonio back in 2003. And they showed with, uh, a whole bunch, you know, mollusks, plant pathogens, insects, they all show if you plot cumulative imports versus cumulative numbers of species established, then you get this attenuation over time that these level off. And, and they attributed this to this phenomenon of essentially depleting the supply of, of, um, of, of source species pools. And they, they, they to fit to this, uh, these kind of relationships, they fit a Michaelis-Menten equation, which actually has nothing to do mechanistically with invasions. It's, it's, a, it's a function that comes from enzyme kinetics, but basically does a pretty good, they found that it does a, a pretty good job of fitting these kind of data. Um, but um, one of the things that, that they very quite rightly pointed out that this phenomenon of depleting source species pools, it's kind of like in community ecology when we sample um, take samples from the field. The first, first sample or the first few samples you take, you're going to find a bunch of species you've never found before. But then as you keep collecting more and more samples, you've, you're already encountering species of, you've already sampled. And essentially that's the way invasions are, that when you import material from one country to another, the first imports have all these new species. And then over time, you have fewer and fewer of these species. Um, and so the question then is, is really, are we depleting, you know, this is the big question, are we depleting the source species pools? And for insects, you know, insects are incredibly diverse and the estimates are that there's, you know, up to 30 million species of insects, which seems hard to imagine that we've come close to depleting that because say in North America, we only have between three and it's a lot, but it's only three to, you know, 4,000, which is less than 1% less than of the world's uh, potential invasive species. So it would seem, no, nah, we're not even close to depleting the species pools. But if you dig a little closer into the data, and these are uh, some data we've compiled for uh, the scolotiny, which are the true bark beetles and ambrosia beetles. And if you look at uh, imports from, um, or introductions from Europe to North America, we've introduced, um, you know, uh, eight out of 85 species. So it's 9% of the European um, bark beetles, which, you know, it's still a pretty small percentage, but it's obviously a lot bigger than 0.03%. Um, so it's still questionable whether we're really depleting these source species pools. But when you look at numbers, these are numbers of, of these scolotiny establishments over time. 
and these are the blue here is the European establishments, it does look like they've over time sort of reached a plateau or sort of saturated out, which suggests that maybe we are depleting the source species pools. So, so the, and the, the big, so why is that? And I think that the, um, the thing is, is that when we talk about, you know, the total number of European uh, species we have uh, established is, you know, only eight out of 85, which not very many, but the reality is there's, you know, a total of 85 species, only a fraction of those are abundant in the pathway. And even a smaller fraction of those are, are actually have any potential to invade. And so the potential, the species that actually do have a potential to invade, we may actually have established a quite a large fraction of those. And that may explain why we've, we've seen this attenuation. Um, it's essentially the same phenomenon that, that over time you, you take more and more samples and you, and you deplete the supply of new species. Um, and in, in, in community ecology, people to model this phenomenon, people have used a log normal species abundance distribution um, to basically model this phenomenon that, you know, there's some species, a lot of species that have very low abundance and just a few species that have a very high abundance. And we did an analysis with these skeletons, with these true bark beetles, where we use port interception data. That is the intercept when people the uh, 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 ports, you know, that are uh, inspectors that inspect material, including wood packaging material, and they find that there there's a very few species that are incredibly abundant in this uh, this wood packaging material, and then this huge number of species that are are quite rare. And so we can actually fit a model to these data. And we, using a, a log normal distribution, we fit a log normal distribution. And, and the key parameter on this is the sigma, the log normal distribution we estimated at around three. Um, we then, we use this in a, in a, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but then in a model that we used to essentially um, um, use this uh, log normal distribution of species abundance distributions, along with a propagule pressure model that relates numbers, uh, uh, essentially propagule pressure to establishment. Um, and this was based again on some of the data where we had um, numbers of interceptions as a proxy for arrival and related that to the probability of establishment. And so the species that are intercepted more are basically the ones with higher propagule pressure and they have a higher probability of establishing. And so there is this, this relationship and that we could use that to make this connection between the species, that especially the species with the are more abundant or more likely to establish. And then we use predictions of or historical trade as well as predictions of future trade. Um, that we, we used historical trade as basically a measure of the strength of the of the um, of the pathways and then made just uh, extrapolated into the future um, uh, uh, what imports would be in the future. And using this, we used a maximum likelihood to fit this model. And again, using this log normal distribution with the sigma of three, it gave sort of a so-so fit. If we actually tweaked that to have a much higher sigma of nine, we actually got a much bigger, much better fit. And so the question is, well, why this, that, that would suggest an incredibly skewed distribution, log normal distribution, and why would it be so skewed? And this gets back again to the fact that that if you're looking at invasions, it's not your typical sort of uh, species abundance distributions. It's a highly skewed distribution because there are only a very small number of species that have a probability of getting into the pathway and even smaller number that have a probability of finding a host and establishing. Um, and so that probably explains why it has this very skewed distribution. And we use this model to basically project into the future and with this using a log normal, this, the sigma of three, which is what we actually fit today, it suggests this really astronomical explosion of number of invasions, where if you use the, um, our, uh, what provided a better fit, which was the sigma of nine, it predicted the sort of constant level of, of invasions off into the future. And sort of, sort of summarizing this part, uh, it basically what the model, this model suggests is, is that, yeah, you do have this phenomenon of, of of depletion of species, and that causes this attenuation of establishments. But it's kind of counteracted that over, over time, we typically observe sort of acceleration in a, if imports. And when you put those kind of two together, they cancel out and very gets, and we get this, this phenomenon of sort of linear increases in number of establishments over time, um, uh, uh, which really just reflects a kind of 
these two opposite effects. Um, so the last couple thing I want to talk about here are discovery lags and modeling discovery lags. So very often, um, as I mentioned before, we in in over time we a species may establishment may establish, but we rarely actually observe the establishment. What happens is the species establishes it then very often starts to grow and it's it and it's extend in the ex invaded area, and then someone discovers it. And so this lag um, between establishment and discovery is referred to as invasion debt, or essentially this backlog of species that have invaded, but we don't even know it. Um, and th there's kind of a classic paper that was done, uh, published in 2007 by Costello et al., where they came up with this really clever approach to modeling this phenomenon. And they, they applied this to data, a data set on numbers of non-native aquatic uh, marine organisms in the San Francisco Bay over time, where they had number, this, this sort of uh, uh, accelerating numbers, cumulative numbers of species discovered over time and trying to relate that to historical imports to the San Francisco Bay Area. And they basically took this process and brought, broke it down into these three processes. And one of the processes was essentially the unfortunately unobserved process, but the thing we're really interested in, which is establishment. Um, so, th th and they basically modeled establishment as a function of, of imports. Um, and then they also included this attenuation factor, which is, is accounting for this depletion of source species pools. Um, but at the same time, they, um, they modeled discoveries um, as, um, that the, the, essentially they said for any species going between, um, between from region uh, from a region of being imported from from a certain region at a point in time, there's a probability of it being dis discovered at a given point in time as a function of when it actually established and the amount and the probability that it could be discovered. And they basically modeled this discovery process as a sort of a waiting time distribution. Um, and in that, there's, they said there's a constant but annual discovery probability. And, and basically what this model produces, this kind of result, is they, um, that over time you have this cumulative number of, of um, uh, observed discoveries, but then it, and then their model has this predicted number of discoveries. And then th what they're really interested in are the actual unobserved establishments. And of course, the num at any point in time, the number of establishments is actually going to be higher between the, uh, than the number of discoveries. And it's essentially the difference between these um, unobserved, be between the, uh, the, the discoveries and the unobserved establishments, which essentially is this invasion lag or invasion debt. Um, and it suggests at any more point in time, there are always going to be more species that have est essentially established and we don't really know it. Um, and well, one of the things, and this is the last thing I'm going to show, which is, um, again, this, this really cool paper by Costello et al., they assume this annual discovery um, probability as constant. And of course, that's not realistic because discovery, the search for insects or any organism, it probably varies through time. So with uh, my colleagues, um, uh, Matt McLaughlin and Mike Springborn, we, uh, we um, did try to look at the possibility is, well, maybe there's a variable that this probability of discovery varies through time. And the data we're working with are numbers of, of um, chemiptera. These are non-native aphids and scales and, and true plant bugs in, uh, that have established or have been discovered through time. And these are, this is a time series of numbers of new um, chemiptera di discoveries by decade these from all these different rural regions. And this is the number, this is the amount of trade from those same regions. And the thing that's kind of interesting, when you look at these two time series, uh, you know, they both show these kind of these two waves of, of, um, of, of uh, imports and establishments. But you see in, in for the imports, the, the second wave is actually much larger than the first wave. And, um, but you see with establishments, the second wave is much smaller. Um, and so in some ways, the establishments seem to be tracking imports, but in some ways they don't. Um, so, and so with our model, we were hoping to try to get a handle on that. 
And with the approach we took is very, very similar to that of, of the Costello uh, model of basically having this, this uh, model of unobserved establishments that's, that's then related to historical discoveries over time. But the key thing is, is that, that um, we didn't assume a constant uh, discovery probability, but instead we used a proxy for, we had a proxy for discovery effort, which was based on the number of native hemiptera discovered in North America over time. So in other words, we just, we thought that the, the, the discovery of native species probably reflects the variation in, in the rates of native discoveries reflects the, the uh, it's related to the same effort that goes into looking for new species. And so we used, it, not, we're not saying it exactly tracks it, but we actually have base say model the assumption that the native hemiptera, there's presumably some constant um, number of native hemiptera, and then over time, if you discover more and more of those, you um, you're gonna you're gonna discover more of those, but you're gonna actually deplete this this sort of true number of native species over time. But we can derive this this um, uh, search effort over time, and so using that, we were able to fit a model then that has um, where again we have the observed and modeled numbers of discoveries over time, and we could actually model the, the true number of established, or we could model the, the number, not, but unobserved numbers of establishments over time. And this is essentially what the model predicts over all these regions, is that we've had this sort of, again, kind of fairly constant rate of establishments over time, but that there's always this invasion debt, that is this difference between numbers of established uh, numbers that are discovered and numbers that are truly established. And that, that currently and over the last hundred years that it's, all, it's um, always been relatively constant that initially the vast majority of these species were unobserved, but currently it's around 27%. And you can see by imports from different areas, it, the species where like Europe, where we've established the most species and we, because we've been importing stuff to North America for the longest time period, the, the invasion debt is actually smaller than in areas where other parts of the world where we've been importing stuff for a shorter amount of time, and there are probably a larger number of, of, of um, undiscovered species. Um, so that's the end of my talk. And um, I know I've kind of covered a lot of stuff and I didn't cover a lot of other stuff that I could talk about, but, but I think I've probably gone way beyond the amount of time I was supposed to talk anyway. So. So uh, Lucy, I can stop my sharing my 